Uh, today's event is Growing Ethical IT Talent in Canada with KIPS' CEO, Greg Lane. Uh, Greg has over 30 years of leadership experience in IT, and he did his master's research report on customer service and outsourcing. He has worked on product sales with Microsoft and Cisco, and has consulted with Deloitte and Accenture. His leadership experience includes volunteer activity with KIPS, ICTC, and ITAC, now Technation, and he has published on the topic of building relationship in a digital world and portals. He has lectured at both Algonquin College and the University of Ottawa on relationship building and IT governance. And Greg is currently an executive residence at the University of Ottawa's eHub program and is the national CEO of KIPS, Canada's Association of IT Professionals. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome you all for, uh, to our IT Professionalism Week events and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, we kindly ask that you keep your mics muted and your cameras off during the event. And if you have any questions for myself, Jonathan Elias, or for Greg, please post them in the chat and we'll have a Q&A portion at the end. Uh, Greg will talk a little bit about KIPS and some member benefits, and then he'll be discussing the important topic about growing ethical IT talents in Canada. And on that note, I'll be turning it over to Greg. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> it's always odd sometimes to hear yourself described, but anyway, <laughs> I appreciate the introduction. So I want to talk a little bit about KIPS, as Jonathan said, because the context of how we think we should be growing talent uh, goes all the way back to our roots, right? So as you can see from a history perspective, 1958 was very early on in the computer industry days and uh, primarily led by, at the time, uh, university professors and lecturers on the topic. And their decision to create a, a, a society or an association was because they wanted to be able to share ideas and, and meet and talk with their fellow professionals and keep up to date. If you think about 1958, there was a lot of changes back then. It really hasn't changed. <laughs> so the same challenges face us today. How do we keep up? How do we network? How do we learn more about what we're trying to do from a, a work perspective or an industry perspective? And we changed our name. Not that it matters a whole lot, but even in 1968, we were thinking more about information and processing than we were about uh, data and technology. Anyway, Jonathan, just keep driving. So just a quick note too, that I'm gonna race through these slides. Um, and if you want to see them at the end, we'll post them on our website, but I'm really just going through from a, for a context perspective. And then I wanna get a conversation started about what is professionalism and how do we grow that uh, requirement or need in Canada and is it gonna change? So quickly talked about, yeah, created in 1958. We, like the country itself, are a federation. So there's a national organization, which I'm the CEO of, and there's also provincial associations and organizations. And because labor law is primarily uh, managed provincially, that's the most logical construct for us as a society as well. And each of the societies is a community of their members, and they develop their own events and have their own opportunities to meet and greet and share. The thing that's probably made the single most significant difference from a societal perspective is in 1989, we got approval for an ISP or a designation that talks about your capabilities and ethics in IT. And it's approved as you can see in, in those provinces. And then in, in 2008, excuse me, we also worked internationally with the IP3P organization, which is a part of IFIP to develop a designation that's recognized internationally. And it's there's progression. So what is the mission? And interestingly, these were written again in 1958. So we haven't changed much as a society in terms of what we think we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that we're able to have the same mission for all those years, protect the public, develop and align IT standards. So making sure that the industry understands the kind of implications that standards have. And we as a professional society are inputting to those conversations at wherever they're happening, but primarily in the legislatures. We wanna increase the recognition of the IT profession so all other professions, quotation marks, or a lot of other professions, lawyers, doctors, accountants, have a professional society and they have managed their own members to a degree for many years now. 
because we're a fairly new society and a new profession, it's a bit more challenging. Integrity and competence are two milestones or keystones to the whole concept of being a professional. Are you able to do the work? And if you're not, you recluse yourself. And are you doing it in a way that you can be proud of and that um, is ethical? We also want to make sure, as we talked about earlier, or I talked about earlier, is sharing. So all of us have different lenses or perspectives, depending on where we're working and the nature of the work we're doing. And getting together and sharing that and, and asking questions of our colleagues and, and contemporaries is a really, really positive way to, to improve your knowledge. The other is making sure the public is protected and is aware of the potential impact and misuse of IT. Thanks, John. So here are some of the relationships. When I talk about the industry, it's a really an ecosystem or a, a bunch of different stakeholders with different perspectives. So we have corporate partners, we have international relationships, we have a community of organizations and entities that we work with to try to make sure that we're all aligned relative to what we're trying to do. So some of the community players that I'm talking about there are the CIO Association of Canada, so the leadership from a CIO perspective across the country, and CSCAN InfoCAN, which are the deans and leads from a faculty perspective for computer science uh, programs in multiple universities and information management programs as well, and a lot of others. Some of them are societies like the DPI, the Association of Public Sector Professionals, and on and on. So we are trying to build the ecosystem and maintain, um, as I say, alignment around thinking and where we're going. One of the key elements that we, we like to think we're doing a good job for is accreditation. And what that means is all the universities in the country that are trying to develop uh, or are developing uh, curricula for teaching what the students will need to be successful in working is how we try to help. So we go into those programs, those universities, we look at the faculty, we look at the environment, do they have the right kinds of uh, labs and, and uh, student classrooms? Are they teaching what we think? And frankly, the international community believes are the right things for students to have as base knowledge when they're graduating and, and joining the professional uh, or the industry. And so you can look at where those are happening. Jonathan, continues to remind me that we have member benefits, and I apologize because I'm not always as on top of this, but one of the things that we think from a member benefit perspective is most important is how individuals develop their own career. So while some people, some entities are focused on helping people get a job, we believe that a career and career planning are more critical um, for the duration of your working life, and, and we want to help with that. We certify professionals, we provide networking opportunities, we have events where you can meet and greet and listen to speakers on various topics. Uh, we have community discussion forums. As I talked about knowledge sharing, if you're having a problem at work and you're wondering where you can go that to just get some people's thoughts or perspectives, our community discussion forum is an ideal place to take those. We provide volunteers, members, the opportunity to, to do things they may not get to do in their working life. So, joining a board, having responsibility for a committee, getting involved in, in organizing an event, sending thank you notes, all the mechanics and, and activities associated with putting on events are things we can offer our members. That plus meeting a whole bunch of new uh, relationships or building a whole bunch of new relationships. We have an IT job board where you can look and see the kinds of roles that are out there and make a decision relative to whether or not you wanna um, apply for those. Or do you want to post jobs in your own organization? And we do have a number of vendors who work with us and provide their services and products to our members at a discounted rate. I talked about professional development. <clears throat> and for me, professional development is a bit like a journey, right? You need to know where you are and you need to know where you want to go or at least have an idea. And then you need to be able to figure out how to get from where you are to where you want to go. And simplistically, that's what we, I, and I think the society in whole, as a whole, considers to be the whole concept of professional development and career planning. So we allow our members to, to access a tool called Skills TX, and that's built on the SOFIA framework, Skills Framework for the Information Age, which has been around for quite a while now, to take a survey, assess their skills, and get a report that details 
what level they're at across all the attributes. And then you can look at jobs you might want to have and um, calculate what it is you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be. You can set career goals um, and you can create an action plan. So if you've got some gaps and you want to figure out how to go from where you are to where you want to be, then the tool allows that planning and, and action to take place. When I talked about Sophia or the skills framework for the information age, it's not just about technology, although technology is a significant element of that, but there's change and implementation, there's relationships and engagement, there's all kinds of activities that you'll find in any kind of a technology job that are required to be successful. And this shows how many attributes there are, 121, don't count them, like, trust me, and each of those has up to seven levels. As you, as you can see from this diagram, some of the attributes are highlighted. And those highlighted attributes have detail and they include enough information for you to be able to decide where is it on each of these attributes that your skills are and how to recognize what they are. An example is, <laughs> this one's digital forensics. So if you think that you're working in digital friends, or you are, and you want to know what level you're at, you can actually go through that whole attribute and see, okay, so this is what I need to be at level four. Am I doing this work? Yes or no. If it's yes, well, maybe I'm level five. So you go up a level. If it's not this, maybe it's level three. So you're able to take the complete mystery out of where you are relative to an accepted international framework and then plot where you'd like to be. So we talk about 121 attributes. It's in 180 countries. Actually, these days it's closer to 200. 180 officially, but over 200 countries are actually using it. And it's been translated into 12 languages. And I just wanna spend a moment on that. So one of the challenges people face when they're moving between countries potentially is a language issue or challenge. And so if you're able to produce your skills inventory in your native language and then see it visually plotted on a graph, then it takes the issue of understanding the nuance of a language out. You can do it in your native language and the report looks the same, whether it's English, French, or any language, it looks the same. The other thing that it allows, in my view, view at least, is it takes some of the bias out. If you're not looking at a CV, you're looking at a report that is dots on a page across a whole bunch of different skill sets, and you're assessing whether the candidate who's produce that report is going to be appropriate for your organization. You have no idea about gender. You have no idea about any other ethnicity, nothing. All you see is what they're able to do. And my belief is that's a beautiful way to start hiring and to make sure that there is the minimum of bias in any of those hiring decisions. The other thing you can do with that um, 121 attributes is if you're trying to create a job profile, you can use them as Lego blocks. I need a digital forensics level four. I need the, all the different skills that you need. You can compile them based on the Sophia framework and that becomes your job profile. So you don't have to create, you just have to understand the capabilities that you want from that person or that role and be able to map those back to Sophia and then provide that to your HR or hiring manager and that's your role profile. And it it's, again, mystery's gone. Uh, we talked about non-IT skills, and it's not just for large companies because that's the perceived benefit is that if you are able to manage a large organization and understand all the skill sets you have in that organization, yes, you can make great headway making sure training is appropriate, that you, you're planning ahead for the demands you're going to have from an IT perspective and making sure you've got the talent available, and it's micro-macro. So not only does it work at a high level, it works for an individual, so the same opportunity exists for an individual. I can manage my career, I can do my training, I can do all of my planning on this same tool. It's, it rolls up and it rolls down. The thing that's different in my mind about uh, Sophia is not only do you talk about what your responsibilities are from a, from a work perspective, but you talk about the level of that responsibility. So all of you on this call who have worked in different uh, jobs know that there are different roles on a team or a group or a committee or anything. So there are people that are there and they're following or assisting and they're making sure that things happen. But there's also people at the very high level who are setting the strategy, who are mobilizing. 
they're managing that whole activity. And it goes all the way in between that. So you're able to determine what type of uh, experience you've got. Is it a follower and a sister, or is it actually setting and inspiring? So the, the ability to use the tool and really apply it to get a really good insight into what this person's able to do is, I believe, it's the best in the market. So that's why we've chosen it. So there's lots of examples about how it's being used, but frankly, the most advanced application of this whole capability or Sophia is in Australia. Uh, New Zealand is coming along. So curiously, the Commonwealth countries seem to be moving forward because the other one that's doing a lot of work in this space is South Africa. And we in Canada are coming along as well. But an example of how it's being used at, a, at an organizational level is the Australian Federal Public Service. They have mapped 161 roles. Pretty much every IT job in the government of Australia has been defined and they've organized them on career paths. The roles are defined using Sophia and everyone can enter their skills and see which potential roles they map to the best. And all positions are posted so that the Australian Public Service can look at what jobs are available and anybody in the public service who wants to can apply, but they can also see whether or not and how well qualified they are by matching their profile to what the requirements are. So it, it, it's a really advanced use of how this tool can be used across a very large organization. Certification. I've talked about what that means. So we talked earlier about ISP, which is the one that's recognized in legislation in Canada and ITCP. So ISP, we've mapped to SOFIA level three. So if you recall that um, diagram of the 121 attributes in the highlighted blocks, you can see where level three fits in. ITCP, a little more senior, it's at level five. And the AITP is actually for graduates. So if you've just graduated from a computer science program and you want to put yourself on a path to become a certified professional, you can apply for and be granted an AITP, which starts your journey along the professionalism path. Um, and here's how you apply. So Jonathan can spend some time, but it's on the website. So you can go to our website and look under certification and application and see the complete requirements for each of those designations and fill out the application. <laughs> and there's different routes. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about that. But what I would say is what we're trying to do is the, the concept or the topic for this is growing ethical IT talent. So not everyone's going to take the same path to becoming uh, an IT professional in Canada. So there's going to be people that have an academic background and experience. There's going to be people that have just experience. There's going to be international candidates. There's going to be all these different potential paths to become certified in Canada. And we have ways to assist in all of those different paths. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Just know that if you're interested, you can look and you will start to understand. And if you have any questions, send us an email and we'll, uh, we'll try and answer and, and point you in the right direction relative to the paths. We talked about ethical IT talent. So one of the ways we believe that it's important for people to understand what ethics is all about is by having a code of ethics. So we've put down in writing what we think the right kinds of ethical thoughts and perspectives are, and we've made it available to all our members. And in fact, if you want to become certified, you have to pass an exam to show that you not just read, but you understand and you can deal with it. And and I want to be clear here as well. So ethics is a bit of a challenge for most of us in all the different nuances or business situations we can find ourselves in. And one of the best ways to talk about it, I believe, is to talk about the fact that a doctor, for instance, has a code of ethics as well. And their mantra, their mission, their saying is, do no harm. If you're a surgeon and you have to cut somebody open to do your job, you are arguably doing harm by cutting the person open. The intent though, is to correct, to, to, to help, to do something that's gonna have a positive outcome for the individual. And that's sort of the ethical challenge that we'll all face. There may be circumstances or situations we find ourselves in that require us to step back for a second and say, hmm, let me think about this. Is it protecting the public interest and privacy? Is it, um, am I doing the right thing? And it, my view comes down to intent. 
If your intent is to do the right thing, then you may have to, as in the case of the surgeon, do something that's momentarily or possibly perceived as incorrect because then that's the challenge with ethics. And that's what we try to make sure that our members and the public understand. We are trying to protect the public. We are taking responsibility and we're trying to help the profession as a whole advance and move forward. So I, I talked about the community forum and where you can go and, and ask questions and share knowledge. And this is accessed by individuals in Canada and frankly, from around the world. So you can enjoy, you can join discussions either provincially in your uh, local area, or you can join in around the world. And it's a little bit like an international water cooler. So questions, answers, perspectives, thoughts, issues, you know, this is a classic evolution of the I knew a guy or I know a guy. You know, it used to be the, the case where somebody would come up to you and say, do you know anything about this? Not really, but I know a guy. And so I believe that the community forum is the internet version of I know a guy. So this is where you go when you don't have a question or don't have an answer and you have a question that needs some perspective. Events. So as you probably understand or know, COVID kind of, put a kibosh on most events that were taking place for a number of years. So to be candid, we kind of lost the thread. So we, we just got out of the routine of having a lot of events and we're getting back into it. As we've talked about the 65th anniversary. So one of the expressions we're trying to use in this 65th year of our society's life, 65, make it live, get back to the networking, get back to events, get back to the kind of situations and pictures, as you can see in this, where people are out, they're listening to professionals, they're able to ask questions, they're able to talk to their peers, they're able to share. So if you're interested in uh, participating, come out. If you are available and want to do more, please volunteer and contribute to local events because the more volunteers we have, the easier it is. And if you want to get an idea of what they're like, we do have a number of events that are recorded so you can get a sense for what happens. and. Jonathan's um, done a great job of posting one of the events that's happening uh, later this month. So this whole conversation around building skills and dealing with talent and why are we doing this? <laughs> well, Canada has a digital skill supply shortage. And frankly, it's not just a Canadian problem. It's an international problem. So as I talked about before, KIPS is a member of IFIP, an international organization that was founded by UNESCO in 1960. And that organization, IFIP's mandate is to try and create the same kinds of things that are at an international level that Canada is trying to do domestically. And so we participate in that and we hear from our colleagues around the world that they're all experiencing similar challenges. There's just not enough talent in the country to meet the requirements for all the businesses that are looking for talent. And if you can see the diagram, it's showing that not only do we have a challenge now, that challenge is gonna persist for quite some time, and so the whole concept of how we build talent is what I've been trying to talk to today, but it involves three or four different factors. From my perspective, it involves academia because we need to be making sure that the universities and colleges are producing talent that's gonna be able to come into the industry and be successful. We need to have the leadership of the IT community, the CIOs, working with us to help us refine and define the kinds of skills and challenges that they're facing. And if there's issues with talent in any area or domain, to help us understand that so we can do a better job of moving back up and, and helping people develop appropriately. And then there's also the government or the legislative challenge. So we're getting new people into the country. So we have immigration, and we want to make sure those people are able to come in and be appropriately hired and work at an appropriate level. And so one of the things we use our uh, skills TX tool for is exactly that. They can fill out their or do their assessment and that assessment will allow us and them to understand where they are and for them to present themselves accurately to employers around what their skill sets are. And again, hopefully taking some of the bias out. We're also trying to attract more students from other uh, disciplines, whether it's business or wherever it happens to be, we believe there's paths and pathways that they can take to become IT and IT professionals. And then skills transfer people in other industries already working who may wanna change careers. 
And the example I use most often is if you're in a, um, a sales or retail environment as a sales agent on a call center, in a call center, you can become, my belief, relatively quickly, a help desk person in an IT environment by learning the specifics of the IT challenge because you're already comfortable with customers, you're already comfortable with the technology, and you have the mentality and ability to deal with questions and, and resolve things over the phone. So there are ways to attract talent um, outside of the traditional path, which is academia or going through school and graduating and joining. So we're, we're working on all those elements and all those elements from my perspective involve assessment and mentoring and supporting people on their journey. Next. So we hopefully have convinced at least one or two of you to become more involved with KIPS. Join your local board, wherever that happens to be. Become a mentor. If you're an experienced IT person, you have a lot to offer. And we'd like to ask you to give that back to the community and to, to support young people or new people to the profession and give them some guidance about how to be successful. Join a national committee. Um, and help shape the future of KIPS. Um, where do you think we should be going and how do you think we should get there? And, and what are your perspectives on some of the issues we face as an industry? And our you interested in international, we can probably find ways for you to participate on the international forums that we're involved in as well. Um, from a student perspective, every student that's in a registered full-time educational institution is available or is able to become uh, a free KIPS member and do their assessment, start to understand where they are and what their journey is. I didn't talk an awful lot about how you progress on Sophia, but it starts uh, at level one, two as knowledge, that which you acquire through a course or uh, education or some form or fashion. You move up to a skill, you've applied that knowledge in a work environment, to a competence or or you've achieved a mastery. So that's the moving from one to seven. And so students should and should be able to see themselves at level one and two and on uh, the Sophia framework as they're taking courses and continue to update their um, profile as they move through. Questions and answer. So I did race through that. I, I promised to go through quickly. I wasn't sure I'd go that quickly, but anyway. Yeah, well, thanks for the uh, great presentation, Greg. Uh, we're going to open it now for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, you can either post them in the chat uh, or you can also raise your hand if you like to uh, use your mic and camera to ask either Greg or myself uh, a question. Uh, one question we have here is uh, what can both individuals and organizations do to assist with the IT talent shortage? Well, so if you're an individual, uh, do your assessment, understand where you are, look at where your options and opportunities are in terms of where do you want to take your career. So I talk about the, the skills TX or the assessment as being a bit of a map, but I think genuinely it's more of a compass, right? So you think about where am I today? What are the kinds of things I'm doing today that I really enjoy? And where can I do more of those things? So becoming the best you can be at whatever level or job or uh, role that you want is one of the ways to deal with the skill supply shortage. If you're um, involved in a business and that organization is having the same challenge, then talk to them about um, how we at KIPS can work with them to help them attract and, and potentially assess and maybe even offer ways to upgrade their skills or upskill or rescale some of the people that, are, that may be interested. A lot of companies are finding now that they're taking employees from other parts of the organization and putting them into IT roles or helping them become IT people and then retaining staff, but reskilling them. So there's lots of different options for individuals and companies that, that we can support and work with to help them be successful individually and as an organization. And one thing I'd like to add, uh, just a nice part of this infographic, which I like, is how organizations, uh, we encourage them to increase the number of uh, entry IT roles. Um, so that they can help develop that talent and then get more of those mid-career and senior specialists opposed to uh, trying to get that IT talent that's out there and, and is more difficult uh, to find. 
Um, especially here, you can see there's a, a big overflow uh, at first with a lot of talent, IT talent, trying to get those entry level roles. Um, but the tricky part is, you know, trying to get that mid career and senior specialists. And if you can get them in house in your organization early and help uh, develop their skills and that relationship, then that's going to assist overall with helping both the IT talents in your organization as well as Canada. Yep, exactly. Thanks, John. Good, good catch. Uh, another question up here is: Has Kips done any surveys about the demands uh, demanding IT jobs in Canada? Do you know what type of IT jobs Canada has demand for? So the short answer is we haven't, but ICTC has. And the graphic on the uh, left of this diagram is actually from one of their reports. And it's been um, documented many times. Now, all of us in the industry would tell you that the, the one that's talked about most these days is cyber and, and cybersecurity and the fact that we are woefully short of talent in that particular space. Um, but there's all kinds of other digital skills that are we just don't have enough of. And there's lots of information. If you want to find it specifically, we can post the ICTC result or you can look at ICTC's website because they've done a lot of work in this particular space. Great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you know, that was a great opportunity. If you do want to turn on your mic or camera for any last minute questions, uh, looks like we had another one coming to the chat. Um, someone's asking, I believe, how do you, oh, I did see it for a second. How do you access the community forum? Uh, that's either at community.kips.ca. Um, and also as a KIPS member, you'll automatically be uh, added to the forum and you'll receive uh, daily digest emails when there are new postings, either within the uh, IT water cooler group for all KIPS members in Canada and around the world, as well as your own provincial community groups. And last call for any questions. Again, you can either just put it in the chat or uh, turn on your mic or camera. And if something occurs to you later, I'm okay with that too. Just send us a question or a, a note and we'll be happy to answer. The, the right place to send it is info at kips.ca and we'll get back to you with a response. 